topic of tonight, the topic of the Mazal, is one of those topics that if you have somewhat of an understanding, I say somewhat because we will never fully be able to understand it, but if you have even a little bit of understanding of how it works and what it's for, your life will be completely changed. Some of you may have heard of Sir Francis Bacon, famous English philosopher, statesman, very smart man, and he said once, amongst other things, in Latin, scientia potentia est, which means in Latin, knowledge is power. You may have heard of that, it's very famous. And you wonder where did he take this from? He didn't just make it up, it's very possible that he took it from Michelet, from Solomon, who writes in Michelet, Given Hacham Oz, an intelligent man, has strength. Shlomo Melech many times puts a tremendous emphasis on the difference between intelligence and ignorance as light and darkness. One who has light, then he knows where he's going. He knows what to do approximately. Tremendous difference between one who knows and one who does not know. And you cannot afford not to know. But even the Nanju, there's so much to gain if he has knowledge. One who has knowledge will understand a lot more about life, what life is all about, what he's expected to do. He will understand a little bit more what creation is all about, why did God create the world. And he will also know himself better. And when you know yourself better and you know what life is all about, then you have a better chance to maneuver in this complex place that we call Earth. So the knowledge of Mazalot, as complex as it may be, some, of the, some, of, some knowledge of this important topic will help us understand many of the mysteries of life. There are many questions that many of us have. And if you know a little bit about Mazalot, some of those questions will be answered. I guarantee you that the Zat Hashem at the end of tonight's lecture some of your questions will have been answered, at least partially, just because of this topic called Mazalot. So let me give you a brief introduction about this topic, Mazalot. Everything that Kadosh Baruch created in the world is active. Even a rock has activity. You just don't see it. There's a nucleus, there's electrons and protons and everything in life. And there is movement inside the nucleus of everything, of the atom, of everything in life. Everything is active, everything has a life. Not everything is moving around, not everything is talking and breathing, but it still has a life, and as the Rambam points out, the Manadis, that not only do they have a function, not only are they active, but they actually have some degree of intelligence. If they are created, they're here for a purpose, then they have some life and some intelligence. We don't see everything, but that's okay. Even though we don't see, it does not mean it, it does not exist. So everything in this world, everything in this life, has a function, has a purpose. Whether it's the greatest galaxy, or whether it's the smallest insect, as we've spoken about before, everything that was created is here for a purpose. Even the cockroach that we don't like to see in our kitchen has a purpose. The spider, everything has a purpose. Everything is good, everything is perfect. It doesn't always make sense to what, but so what? There is a reason for everything, and that is why they were created. Now, in order to make everything function properly, God created systems. Let's use the word in English called the system. Everything works through a system. A system has laws and rules. What does that mean? After he created the world, he didn't just bail out, as some people claim. He's not around, I can't see him. He created the world, well, it makes sense to me that somebody created, somebody designed it. Right? But where is he? I don't see him. He's still around. We call that Ashgahat Hashem, divine providence, which explains a lot of things. One of them being the survival of the Jewish people after so many years of persecution. So he's around. We owe him our survival. He's Mashgiach. But just because he's Mashgiach does not mean that everything in this world is actually being moved by 
by him. He created the world, but he also put in systems, and the systems are the ones that handle everything. In order to understand a little bit what a system is, just think about a car or a plane, or even a microchip from the largest creation that the human being has put together to the smallest, the microchip, I think is one of the smallest ones. It is so complex. There's so many mechanisms. It's an entire system. And the way it functions, the way it works, is that it follows certain laws or certain programs that have been programmed into it. And as long as everything does the job properly and follows the instructions and the rules, then it will do its job. The human being within his body also has a whole system. Right? The digestive system, the respiratory system, these are all systems. The heart has its own system. As long as they're all functioning right, and the blood is able to circulate, and the lungs are able to breathe, and the kidneys are able to work fine, then, the, then we are healthy. We will function and we will live whatever number of years has been determined for us to live. And just like the human being has his own system, there's a lot of other systems out there that God created that follow certain rules. There is a system of what we call nature or tema, whether it's the sun and the moon, or whether it's the rain or the wind, whether it's the plants growing and the oxygen that comes from the trees, or the animal kingdom. All of these are systems that are in place and they all follow certain rules. So in the same way that we have all these systems that we are somewhat familiar with, there's another system that I'm introducing to you tonight. That is the system of mazalot. Mazalot is something that we cannot see, but we are told that it has to do with the position of certain planets at the time of Earth. And they, from a great distance, influence everything on this planet. They influence our life. Mazalot. It's a system. A system that follows certain Based on these rules, what will be determined? Our life. Our life meaning how long you will live, how tall or short you will be, how beautiful you will be, how smart you will be, how healthy you will be, how many children, how much parnasa, livelihood, what kind of parnasa. All of this is determined by the mazal. Now you may interject for a moment, but wait a minute. I thought beauty, intelligence, that has a little bit to do with the genes of one's parents. Yes, it's true. There are other factors, I will admit. There are other factors that contribute to, to the, your look, your appearance, even the geographical location. I'm sure many of you could tell by looking at someone, he was born in Iran. 
He was born in Russia. He was born in Latin America. Why? Because the geography, as the rabbis tell us, does have an influence on the looks and appearance. Even though some scientists will not agree with this, this is what the Zohar says, this is what the Gemara says, we see that it's a fact that the location definitely has something to do with one's appearance. And obviously, one's parents too. They are partners in producing the child, and they also have some contribution, what we call the genes. And in the same way the genes have instructions what to give over to the future generation, so does the mazal. The mazal, the system that we call mazal, has certain instructions as to what kind of a life this individual will live. Why is this important to us, that there is a mazal? Because we said before that the human being is limited, physically, mentally. In other words, even though he has this free will, which makes him so much more flexible than everything else in the world that lives by instinct, and is much more of a robot, the human being is not a robot. He has free will. Nonetheless, as a result of this system called mazal, he has an additional limitation in his movements. In other words, not only mentally, not only physically is he limited, he can't do everything he'd love to do, but even in his activities. You cannot become a millionaire if it's not meant for you to become a millionaire, according to your mazal, no matter how hard you will try. And that is one of the ideas that we're going to talk about tonight. Why not? I know there's a lot of books out there, how I made my first million. After you buy his book, he's going to make his second million. <laughs> and I think he wants to sell you this theory that he thinks is so true. It's ridiculous nonsense. Of course, there are certain strategies in real estate that they tell you use other people's money. Okay, yeah, I learned that too. But does that mean if I use other people's money, I'm going to make it rich? Does that mean that I can buy as much as I would want to for the best price possible? No. There's a lot of people out there who regret having sold their home two years ago. I should have just waited. I should have just waited for another year or two, I would have made more money. Right? If you would have sold it today. There are a lot of people who regret not having bought 20 years ago, when everything was so cheap. Is there anything to regret or to feel bad about? Not after you understand the nice stuff you mm. No matter how smart you are, no matter how much college you have, no matter how much money you have in your pocket, it makes no difference. You will see that everything ultimately depends on your mazal. Either you have the mazal or you don't have the mazal. And there's different kinds of mazal. So even though we don't see the effect, we don't see the mazal themselves, it, it becomes very obvious and very apparent that the effects are there. Just like one does not see the people asking that. I don't see the mazalot. How could you tell me that the moment you are born, the mazal influences you? Tell me, do you see radio waves? Do you see the electricity? Well, if you put your finger in the outlet, you'll feel it. You don't have to see everything. It's there. Just look at the effects. Ultra, ultraviolet, the uh, infrared, all these other wavelengths in the color. Right? There's different kinds of telescopes that are able to pick up the various colors of the various wavelengths that are out there that the naked eye cannot see. So, so what? Does that mean it does not exist just because you can't see it? Take a look at the facts. You can see the effects. The effects are there. So anyway, what we see right now is that there is a system out there that I who created called Mazalot that has an effect on our life. And now we have to understand why is that necessary? Why did he create the system? Let me ask you a question. Why did everybody who went through high school <coughs> decide whether when they finish through high school they're all going to become lawyers or become uh, CPAs or become doctors? Why doesn't everybody want to become the same thing? Wouldn't it be nice uh, to be a lawyer, or to be a doctor, to I mean, make good money, they're popular? Well, not all lawyers are popular, actually. But anyway. You are. Well, why, why, it's a good paying job. 
So you, some people might claim, well, long hours. Okay, so you pick something else that is shorter hours. Why doesn't everybody think of the same thing? Why doesn't everybody think of the same thing? Go to any school, any college, and you will see an incredible variety of jobs, of careers. Whether it's a programmer, a nurse, a doctor, a lawyer, a carpenter. I mean, you have everything out there. Why doesn't everybody do the same thing or possibly the same thing? What's the simple answer? Because there needs to be a balance. We need carpenters, we need plumbers. The carpenters and plumbers are not going to be doctors. Let them become the carpenters, let them be the plumbers. As long as they do a good job, that's the main thing. Let everyone, let everyone do what his heart desires or what he has the talent for, what he likes, what he studies. And in the end, there's other shit, we will have a beautiful balance of whatever is needed is there. So in the same way that professions are necessary, in the same way every aspect in life is necessary. In other words, all the ups and downs, poor, rich, healthy, sick, all of these are necessary. All of these God created in order for there to be some sort of balance. Now what kind of a balance can there be when everybody, some people are rich and some people are poor? It would be nice if everybody were rich. What's the necessity of having some people born in a mazal that is poor? The explanation for that is because the world is a very complex place. Complex meaning that even though certain rules have to be followed, there's also a certain goal that has to be accomplished. There's a certain destination that we all have to get to. <clears throat> there is reward and punishment for our deeds. There is what we call Sakhar Ba'onish in Hebrew. There's something called Tikkunim, which we'll talk about more when we discuss reincarnation. That the soul has to go through, experience certain things in order to atone for something, to repair something. And there are challenges, as we call them in Hebrew, nisyonot, that God tests us. Okay, I'm going to give you all this money, let's see what you do with it. You're going to throw it away in Vegas, or you're going to put it to good use. That's called nisyonot. In other words, the wealth and the poverty that are out there are intended also to challenge us and to accomplish whatever it is that needs to be accomplished. That is why you have these extremes. You need to have it. If you would not have poor people, then how would you ever have the mitzvah tzedakah? That is one of the most important things what? that we have in Adam and Chavero, a man, a man to, between fellow Jews, to help, to be kind, to be charitable. If you would not have different levels of income, then everybody would not need to each other. And in order to have this mitzvah, or to have this, this uh, relationship between people, that people help each other, and people have to do with other people's lives, there's a need to create some who are wealthy and some who are that's not the only explanation of why people are rich and people are poor, but I give you an example of why there's a need for that. Now, what's going to determine if somebody's poor and somebody's rich? Not if he got a PhD, and not if he inherited money from his parents. A lot of people have inherited a lot of money, and guess who ended up with the money? The lawyers, or the IRS. The brothers fought amongst themselves, and none of the money remained. Or it could happen that they did get some of the money. The wealth will not always be gotten by inheritance. It will not necessarily be gotten by one's intelligence. It will be gotten by one's masada. The best example that I think most of us can relate to is new immigrants. <coughs> new immigrants that have come to this country do not speak the English language, do not even have a college degree. They, they don't even know how to sign their name. And somehow, the first piece of property that they bought, they were able to turn over millions of dollars very good. I'm sure all of you know somebody like that. He's not intelligent, he has no PhD, he never went to college, barely knows English, and he's very rich. And I'm sure people know, you, you also know someone the other end. He knows a lot, he's very knowledgeable, he's smart, and he's not doing so well, he's struggling, barely making a living. So that's what Shulam Omelech tells us in Kohelet, Kidola Achamim Nechem. Does not guarantee that if somebody's a Acham, smart, that he's going to have bread to eat. What does it have to do? It has to do with something called mazal. Mazal is what determines if one is going to have chokmah, if one is wisdom, if one is going to have wealth. Nothing to do with how much effort one put in. It has nothing to do with one's parents and one's surroundings. It has to do with mazal. Once we understand
understand this, and I'm going to elaborate a little bit more, but once we understand this point, that the effort, when it comes to the area of wealth and poverty, is really insignificant, we will understand, or we will have an answer to the famous question of why Sadiq Verano Rashad the Tonko. One of the most difficult questions that people ask is, how come the righteous are suffering and the wicked prosper? <coughs> Because one's mazal in this world is not determined necessarily by one's deeds. You can be a bigot, and you can be wicked and cruel, and still be very wealthy. And God is, is uh, blessing those who are evil. No, it's not a blessing. It's called mazal. And when was the mazal determined? Before the man decided to become a rasha, a wicked man. Forty days before conception of that. Forty days, it is determined what's the package that this boy or girl is going to have in their life. Regardless of how they turn out to be in their conduct, in their deeds. So rule number one, when it comes to Mazalot, yes, even though there are certain rules out there that determine what our life will be like, we still have free will, but in what area? Only the area of Yerashamayim. So the Rabbi tells us rule number one in Mazalot, Akol Gidei Shamayim, Chutz Mirat Shamayim. That's a very big revelation. You know why that's a revelation? That everything is in the hand of God except for the fear of heaven. That's a tremendous revelation because there have been always camps of philosophers of different schools of thought. That one school said, there is predestination. That's it. Everything is locked. You cannot change. That's what is meant to be. That's what it will be. And we are robots. That can't be. The all Torah is against the school of God because otherwise why would we be rewarded and punished? Why do our deeds make such a difference? So we know that that school of thought is completely wrong. Then there's the other school of thought. No. Man has free will. Nothing is predestined. Man can change anything he wants. That's not true too. Rule number one, the Torah teaches us, the rabbi mentioned, is that kol bidei shamayim, chutz mila shamayim. Except for the fear of heaven. What does that really mean in other words? That everything, as far as our source of income, how much income, what kind of children, who our neighbors will be, how many lawsuits, how long we will live, healthy or not healthy, except of course if you smoke. Now you can do harm to yourself. You may have good genes, but if you smoke, you can hurt yourself. People commit suicide, too. that's not predetermined. That wasn't predestined. People have free will in certain areas. If you don't dress up well, you're going to catch a cold. If you go to Mexico City and you drink the water from the faucet, you're going to get an extra stomach. And some more things besides that. It's unhealthy. So watch yourself. But other than that, other than that, I could be this Shemayim. Puts me on Shemayim. Everything has been determined by Shamayim except for the fear of heaven. Are you going to behave yourself? Are you going to be a good husband, a good father, a good friend? That depends on, on your conduct. That's up to you. Are you going to put on the feeling tomorrow morning? Are you going to put on the on your door? Are you going to make a blessing? Are you going to say thank you? That depends on you. You make those decisions. But if one day in the morning you decide to take the four or five instead of the five, you did not make that decision. You think you did, but it has to do with your mazal. Maybe it wasn't meant for you to be on the, on the fire this morning. Maybe for some reason you had to meet somebody. Maybe for some reason you had to get somewhere a little bit later than what it should have been. That's all the condition like. That's all the command and the mana. That's all directed from above. You've heard of people who missed the plane, who missed the flight? Usually nothing happens when you miss a flight, you just feel bad. And you take the next flight. What happens if you miss the flight and, and, and later on you found out that that plane, Pan American Airlines, went down? You feel good. So you think you just happened to miss the flight? You think you just happened to have been caught in, in traffic? There's nothing that really just happened. There's only great. Judaism very much is against the belief that just something can happen by chance. There's such a thing as the word chance. There's no mikre. Everything, for everything there's a reason. Either it's part of the mazal or something else. That something else is called ashgaha. Ashgaha means that he's looking over us. And whenever he looks over us,
because he sometimes breaks his own rules. <clears throat> the obvious examples of breaking the rules is either natural disasters, earthquakes, tornadoes, and the other way around. The positive changes to the rules. Miracles. She had a tumor and just disappeared. She only had 10 days to live and she lived for another 25 years, I think. Somehow, Shem interceded on her or his behalf. Many of you, I'm sure, have heard of this kind of story. The doctors call it, oh, it's a miracle. They say that. They don't really mean it because they don't believe in miracles, but they have no other explanation except to say it's a miracle. We have no explanation for it scientifically <coughs> other than it's a miracle. How could it be a miracle? How could the Jewish people win a war in six days? Well, it gets all the odds. They still don't understand how. You can't even teach the Six-Day War you know, to other militaries because what rules are you going to follow? There were no rules. It was complete. Ashgachat Hashem, incredible miracles. So Hashem sometimes breaks his rules. That's called Ashgachat. That's called divine providence. In that case, he is a form of a tremendous storm. Because what is a storm? What's an earthquake? What's a major disaster? We spoke about the rules in the past. That these are ways of God showing that he's still around, he's still the boss. But that's not nature. The geologists will try to tell you that it is nature. There is a, there's something called the San Andreas Fault, running up California. From Southern California, close to the Mexican border, all the way close to the San Clemente, San Francisco. The San Andreas Fault. And if that shakes up, and those people who are close to the fault are in trouble. Yeah. That happens to be false. But who, who put the faults there? Who decides when the fault wakes up? Now, those who do not believe in God, of course, will have a, a, a difficult time with this whole subject, not just the, the subject of natural disasters, even the subject of Mazarot. Because it's esoteric, it's metaphysical, they can't see it, they can't relate to it. They think it's hocus pocus. You mean there's such a thing as horoscopes? You mean Judaism believes in that too? Well, Mazat Hashem, in the coming weeks, I'm going to show you what an astrological map is according to Judaism. So we're going to be talking about another part of the Mazan. That's the Mazan that deals with one's personality and individuality, which is much more important than what we're talking about tonight. Tonight is very important for other reasons, because it will help us, as I said before, to maneuver and to properly relate to what is happening in our lives. Otherwise, we're going to be miserable or bitter or depressed if we don't understand why? It's not fair. Why does he have a better life? Why is she doing so much better? And so forth. So, the Zad Hashem, with tonight's topic, we will understand the part of the Mazam that deals with one's destiny. And in the coming weeks, we'll talk about another very fascinating area of the Mazam, which is the second part of the Mazam, that says that at the moment of one's birth, it is determined what his inclinations will be, what his strengths and weaknesses will be, what talents he will have, how he will communicate with people. He's going to be a tough cookie, rough guy, right? And that has nothing to do with him growing up in Harlem or in the Bronx, right? Yeah, some people, when they grow up in certain areas, of course, they become tough. And he could be sometimes, of course, if one goes to the Israeli army, he becomes very, very tough. Yeah, some wives do not recognize their husbands when they come back after three years or whatever it is from the Israeli army, especially in certain units. They were trained to become tough and cruel. Yes, of course, I agree that the surroundings have a lot to do with it too. But in the end, there's something, there's a component that's called Mazal that really, really, more than anything else, more than the genes, more than the surroundings, really determines what kind of individual he will be. Will he be nice and kind and compassionate? Or will he be tough? Stinging. And of course, it does not mean that you need to be like that. We have these tendencies, we have these inclinations, but let's not forget that we have the most important the most important asset is that free will. We have the free will that where we can control ourselves. You are what you are to an extent, but you can definitely control yourself. And that's what the Torah is for. The Torah is meant to be a guide and a man on how to live our lives correctly. Even though you are born with certain, certain views, or, or, sorry, with certain inclinations, and you pick up certain views from the street, you can change your mind, you can think differently, you can believe differently than what you, than what you were taught in the past in communist Russia. Look at the man, look at the Torah. You can read 
train yourself. And as far as your innate or what you have in your, in your uh, personality, which is harder to change, that at least you can control. As long as you know what's right and what's wrong, you will know to control yourself. We have very specific people I just want to quote to you that uh, give us a little bit more meaning as to how these things, some of the things are controlled from above. I just wrote down a couple over here. Hashem Morishu Ma'ashir. Hashem is the one that causes one to be impoverished, or to become wealthy. Kelokim Shopet Zem Ashpil Bezem Erim, Bezem Erim, Akadokokum Judges. He determines who goes down, who goes up. And there are people whose mazal is very interesting. Uh, it's like a roller coaster. The roller coasters, they go up and they go down. Some people have that kind of mazal. For 10, 15 years, great. If they're a broker, real estate broker, for example, they're selling, they're doing well. Or if they're doctors, they have, or lawyers, they have clients. And all of a sudden, it's a dry spell for the next five, six years. Then things come out. Now, they don't know anything about Mazarot because they always it has to do with the seasons, it has to do with the economy. That's Kosh to York. That's all that's it. Yes, the economy, of course, has a little bit to do with everything. But there is a Mazar that is up and down. There is a Mazar that is clear. From the moment he graduated until the day he dies, he's doing great. Some people have such a great Mazar that they can smoke cigars every day and live to 100. Jordan Burns. What does it have to do with? By the way, that's not just mazal and maybe good genes too. It also has to do with the attitude. The person is happy if he is humor, if he has a sense of humor, he doesn't take things too close to heart, he's not so sensitive, he's not insulted. And he's, he's going to definitely be a lot healthier. A lot of people become unhealthy because they become bitter and depressed and upset and disappointed. And if one understands a little bit of what we're talking about tonight, it's going to save him a lot of disappointments. And there's no reason for him to be upset in his spirit. Except that himself, if he did not do that which was, which was which needed to be to, to done according to the Torah. But as far as accomplishments, or success and favor, it's not always up to us. You can try as hard as you, you want. If it's not meant to be, should have done or nothing will help. You can work 26 hours a day if that was possible. And you're not going to make more than what was <coughs> written before, what was determined before. Yes? Yeah. Here's what I don't understand. Okay. okay. The extremes, the excellent mazel on the one hand, uh -huh. or the horrible mazel on the one hand. Right. That's one thing. But if you place yourself in the right situation, and not, not talking about the extremes, about the 10% on each side, but uh -huh. the, the, the sweet spot, the, the 80% by applying yourself in school when you're younger, or by making the right friends, or staying with uh, a certain group of people who are more successful, or more educated people. Right. That's playing the odds. Don't you make your own model with respect to the, the center, the, the That's majority? That's a very good question. Did everybody understand the question? Yeah. Basically, if you put yourself in the right situation, follow the rules, when you go to the right people, then aren't you making your own model? Except to the extreme, which you talked about. And what's the answer to that? Yeah, but who put that into your mind? Uh, generally, if you get good grades in school, and you go through it, you, you, there are very few lawyers or doctors who are starving. They, there are lawyers who some may make a fortune, but everyone makes a living, or most make a living. But that's already a second question. As the ones who are who are saying not starting. But in answer to the first question, if you went to the right people, if you went to the people that are gonna that are gonna make it easy for you, that you're gonna succeed by associating with them, who put that into your mind to go there, to that to that address? Who put that into your mind to pick up the newspaper and read all the ads and choose that one? Who made it so that in the interview where you were one of ten, you were chosen? Have your parents made you then you must have. You must have. You must not determine you. You must not put you know, those GPAs.
GPS that people have in their cars. Mm -hmm. Turn right. <laughs> Go five miles down and then turn left. Have you, had, have you ever seen those in your car? Yeah? Right? You have a GPS system in your body. That's the design. Go right. Go left. Go right. Go left. Until you're going to meet the guy who's going to hire you and give you a job. Now, getting back to your second question. Are you going to say most lawyers are not starving. They're making good living. The child, the student that decides to become a lawyer and pass the bar too, okay, and get a job and he's making a living somewhat, he has an average or better than average result in order for him to be accommodated in that profession. Obviously, the rabbis do tell us that there are rich and poor in every profession, but you just told me, yeah, but most lawyers are not poor, they're at least making a living. Yeah, but you agree with me that even amongst lawyers who are working for many years, there are various degrees of income. Yeah. Why? It has to do with myself. It has nothing to do with how hard he's been working. But you can say, yeah, but he does work hard and he is smart. Yeah, but where does that working hard and smartness come from? From the myself. You know, in the end, it's not that he made a decision on his own and he gets the credit. It's really the myself getting the credit. And that's a very, very important point here. Because we think that we should get the credit. The Torah warns us, don't ever say, we have the best air force in the world, the Israelis wanted to say or claim. Don't ever say, it is because of my PhD, because of my strength, that I was able to succeed. Never say that. Because Hashem wanted you to succeed. So He showed you the way. And He made sure that you meet the right people. Somehow, you know, whatever it is, depending on what we're talking about, if it's a job, or, he made it happen. You mean I get no credit whatsoever? Of course you get credit because you did something called in Hebrew Ishtadut. You did not sit at home and wait for it to happen. You actually picked yourself up and drove maybe 25 miles for that interview, and you took the exam. Of course you had an input. Of course you made the effort. But whether those efforts are going to be rewarded or not, how many people try to take the bar and fail? What are the statistics? And they're very smart people, too. What does it depend on? It depends on the Mazab. Mazab doesn't it depend on intelligence? No, it doesn't depend on intelligence. A lot of people have a very high, high IQ, high IQ, but they're slow in making decisions. They look at the problem, your time is up. But he's a smart guy. But he's not fast. We have another guy who guessed because it was multiple choice. <laughs> And you know what? The doctor you're going to may be one of those. The oh, no. smartest and brightest guy, and you're going to him because he wears a white gown and he has a certificate that he graduated from Berkeley. So what? That doesn't mean he's the best doctor. Yeah. So is it also about by a person's muscle that, for example, will get divorced? Is that preordained before? Uh, That's an excellent question. Most of the time, it's not preordained. Divorce is in the category of Yerat Shamayim, the decision that you make that concern your spirituality or your relationship with individuals. Do you want to put up with your wife or not put up? Does she want to put up with her husband or not? They have some problems. So it's up to them if they're willing to put up with it or not, to work on it or not. And some things are very difficult to put up with. But there are times that the divorce is generated from above. But they are the exception, not the rule. Divorce is usually one of those areas that human beings didn't decide. Do we want out or do we want to stay put because of our kids, for example? We love our kids, we want them to have a decent home. And after they grow up, then they split. That's a very good decision. You know, be considerate of your, of your kids before you make this kind of decision of divorce, which is not always looked up favorably. Yes? So you're just saying that once you just get married to somebody else, that's the soulmate. That's the soulmate. Soul soul see, we have to be careful not to drift to another subject, right? So you, you think just it's one man and one woman? Uh, that's already a different subject. I really have to. So we have to be careful. Know? You see, we have to be careful. It's not fair to, to jump to another subject. That's a beautiful, and fascinating subject. Maybe that would have to happen for that person to go to somebody else or something else in their life. Well, yeah, I just said, I did, I did say, and I did agree. That sometimes people get divorced because it was meant to happen. Because the time has come at this predetermined moment that they're going to meet a real soulmate, which they did not 10 years ago. 
But I didn't want to get too much into it. He said, he said, yes, there are exceptions, and you were right. That will be an example. But let's talk about it when we get to Solvents a couple weeks from now. It's an incredible topic. Why people marry certain people? That has to do with the mazal. So by the way, since I've already mentioned it, it is related to the mazal, but it's a lot different in a very important way. That when it comes to soulmates, we're dealing with souls. Only he knows which souls go together. There's no system out there that connects the two lines. He knows when they're running around. She's in New Zealand, and he's in Fairbanks, Alaska. And you know what? They're going to decide to take a, a cruise at the same time, and they're going to meet in Haiti. In Haiti? I you pronounce it. In the Caribbean. Okay? They decide to take, that's what they meet. And who do you think put it into their mind to take a cruise at the same time? They're meant for each other. He did. So that is a lot more than just Masab. It has to do with Ashkaha. When it comes to soulmates, when it comes to marriage, Shen's hand is involved most of the time, not all the time. For some people, they want to marry the one they want to marry, regardless of what his opinion is. That can happen too, because what did we say before? And we need to remind ourselves again, we have some free will. And if we insist on, I want her because she's got money, right? Shen says, she's not for you. But if you insist, I'll let you have it, you're going to regret it. So, sometimes Hashem allows us the liberty to make silly mistakes. Some of them are very expensive mistakes. So if we are just sincere and do things normally and leave it in His hands, everything will work out. By the way, does anybody know why we say Mazal Tov? What's Mazal Tov? There's no such a thing as Mazal Tov and Mazal Ma. We just finished saying that there is different Mazalot, Everyone has a function, everybody has a mission. Everyone has to accomplish something, that is why everybody's given a different package. Just like in ecology, you have a balance, right? The owl does this, the snake does this. We need everybody. So there really is no mazar ra'i mazar tov. Everybody gets what they need for good reason. You have to be happy with whatever you have. Doesn't mean you can't ask for better. And I'm going to talk about that too. Can we change the mazar soon? But right? we have to understand that a mazal, regardless of what it is, is good. It's there for a reason. We need everybody's mazal. We're all cooperating. Another pasuk, Otehachet Yadecha, was the other Kohanasun that we say every morning, which reminds us that the Parnasah, the one who opens up our hands and gives us what we need, is from above. In other words, even though it comes from him directly, how it comes about, you're going to, be, you're going to get good mazal. You're going to have great parnasa, but you're going to have to travel to work 50 miles in every direction. You like that? Wouldn't you prefer it that you be able to work out of your home? I mean, the Sephardim, in the Birkat Amazon, they have a version of the station, Ye Parnasa, Tenu Krovar Ayir. It's a beautiful thing. God, make it so that our parnasa should be close to town. You know, close to home. Who wants to travel, especially the freeways? You know, today, very difficult. So how the Parnassah comes about, is it difficult or hard? Yeah, you're going to make a lot of money. But you're going to have a lot of headaches. You see, yeah. in the same good Parnassah, there's also levels. I'll give you another example of what's the Somebody bumped into you in the back. You're minding your own business. Has it ever happened to you? You're minding your own business, you're waiting at the red light, and something just bumps into you. It happened to me. The guy was drunk. And of course, you get some money from the insurance company for it. And it's nice, it pays for some bills, you know, besides just fixing the car. What's that supposed to be? It's also part of your mazal, but it's through a, you're going to get it with a little bit of back pain. Right? You're going to get bumped. You're going to be involved in an accident. But don't worry, everything will be okay. Nothing will happen to you. You can make some money out of it. But was that one, did that one come easy? It did not come to bingo. <laughs> it came through somebody bumping into you. How you get the money, is it hard or is it easy? That's all part of the masa. Well, but that, that can be also something. No, of course. Why is it that way? That's the question as to why needs to be like that. Because it's also a kapara for something. An atonement or something, and in the meantime, here you need an extra five thousand dollars, right? 
So then you're going to get both. Because God, God, God kills two birds in one stone. Right? You're supposed to get a katara, an atonement, plus you're supposed to get some money that you very much need it back. He says, you know what, you're going to get it this way. Why this way? Only he knows. Another pasuk, Yesh Sadiq, Oven Bezitko, Yesh Rasham Marit Beranato. Very important pasuk that also basically goes along the same lines of reminding that the son of Sadiqim do everything right. They're righteous, they pray three times a day. But they unfortunately they lose so much in their life. They have very difficult lives. In Yesh Rasham, there's a wicked man, Shemarit Beranato, who lives for 110 years. Nothing happens to him. How could that be? And the answer to this is that 40 days before the formation of the fetus, it was already decided what kind of a mazal the individual is going to have. And that mazal will not necessarily change because this man decides to be evil or a broken or a thief. And that Sadiq who decided at age 24 to be a good man, a generous man, a righteous man, doesn't mean because of his generosity and his goodness, and he's, a, he's, he's an angel. Does not mean that he's going to have a better mazal because that mazal is locked in, in a sense. And I'm going to, I'm going to elaborate on, on that a little bit soon. That mazal is really locked in before the individual made a decision to be wicked or to be righteous. Therefore, when we see somebody who doesn't deserve it, he's terrible. Why does God make him so prosperous? It has nothing to do with his current status. His mazal is locked in when he was before he even was born. Now, if you turn to the Torah, you will have a problem with this. You will have a question. Because the Torah says in various places that the Jewish people's destiny really depends on our conduct. In the Hokotai if you follow my commandments, you will have rain on time, you will not have any war, you will have peace and prosperity. So what's going on? That's a contradiction to what I just said. That one's deeds has nothing to do with his prosperity, with his life. What's the answer to that? First of all, the Torah is talking to the Jewish nation as a whole, as a nation. There's a system of the nation, and there's an individual system for every one of us. When it comes to the system of the nation as a whole, Hashem says, listen, life is tough. You have to sweat. You have to work hard for a living. Life is hard enough, but you know what? You are my kids, and I'm going to make it easy for you. If you do everything right, then everything will be okay. No enemy is going to think of attack or attacking you. They're going to bother. They're not going to bother you. You're going to have rain in this coming time. You're going to have enough rain. You won't have to think about importing rain and water from Turkey like the Israeli government is starting to do for many years. They always have friends that are going to enough water in the Kinetic. They never have, they, I don't think they ever had to import water from Turkey yet. Even though they had difficult years. This is meant for us as a barometer on how well we're doing. Is nature cooperating with us? Enemies like us or not, that's for us a barometer of how we are doing. Oh, oh something is wrong, then something is wrong with us. Otherwise, why are they going after us? Do you think that the, the Catholics in Europe just decided one day because they had a crazy a bishop, let's go attack the Jews who don't believe in you know who? Who put that into his mind? Why are they attacking? Why are they killing innocent children? Nothing happens for no reason. I mean, this is supposed to be an indication that something is wrong with us, otherwise they will leave us alone. So we need to have a system, this is a big system in place, that he put, a, he put in place, that should act as a barometer. Are we doing well or not? And that will only produce normal things. What do I mean by normal? Normal life, peace, rain, that you will always have enough. It does not mean you're going to be rich or poor, you're going to have culture versus three, you're not going to have any losses. All of that is part of the individual mazal that does not affect the entire Jewish nation. But what affects the Jewish nation as a whole is a whole different system. So what the Torah describes affects the Jewish nation as a whole. The individual on his own is directly influenced by his personal and customized mazal. Rabbi tell us, the Zohar mentions that that when it comes to length of life, children, and parasa, it has nothing to do with the zechut. The person who did a lot of charity, the person who did a lot of misbot, it has to do with the mazal. The Kohelet says, in other words, it has nothing to do with how smart he is. All of these help us understand a little bit better that it 
has nothing to do with how much effort one makes and how intelligent one is. It's purely the mazal. Now, when a person has a difficult mazal, what is he supposed to do? The rabbis tell us another rule. God, if you put you in a situation, he also gave you the strength and the ability to be able to bear it and to deal with it. He will not demand of you or expect of you more than what you can handle. There are some couples, unfortunately, who you know, have difficult children. And I don't want them to say what difficult means because you understand there's different levels of difficulty. And some are very difficult. He gave them the strength of being able to tolerate and being able to deal with this child. They might need outside help. That's okay. Why did they have that child and somebody else? That's, a, that's his Kishmoor. When we talk about reincarnation, I'll explain a little bit more why certain children are born the way they are. Never, I mean, they're children. They don't even know right from wrong. Why do they deserve to be the way they are? That's a whole different topic. But still, it's related to our topic because it's the mazal that determines, the mazal that determines what kind of a life they're going to have. And that, the reason why they receive that package deal the reason behind that, that's already the topic of reincarnation. What did the soul do in a previous lifetime to deserve to be born with these challenges, or with these circumstances, with this kind of what we call myself? So that's another topic. Yeah. Why in that context do we uh, we have a uh, certain resolve, maybe a little difficult, childless, or, yeah. or problems with Parnassa? Do we go to uh, certain rabbis for Shagula's rabbi and ask the Shagula? Yeah, that, 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 that's, the next, that's the last topic. I just wanted to talk about every point separately, that all these points are important points. And let us not forget that the more difficult your mazal is, and you still accomplish your goals, the goals that is common to all Jews, you're going to get rewarded a lot more. If somebody grew up in a home where uh, it was very difficult to be Jewish, he nevertheless disciplined himself to went against everybody, even though they, they mocked him and he had a difficult time and he still preserved and his Jewish, his reward will be greater than somebody who grew up in a religious home and they had it easy. So in the end, your mazal, as hard as it may be, has also the benefit of that if you go along with it and you still uh, fulfill your role and accomplish everything that is expected of you, your reward will be much greater than the average individual who may not have such a hard mazal. Yes, um, if you look at the individual people in the Torah, yeah. a lot of the things that happen to them, the Midrash says, we have benefit with, uh, because he did something back then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He never talks about the Mazal, that, that was his Mazal. So there's a lot of, uh, did they know that this was their Mazal? That's, that's, a, that's a very good point. Thank you for asking that question. It is true, and even though I, I spoke a little bit about it in a different context, but we do find in the Torah that there is something called punishment. God becomes upset and goes out after even the individual. That's a different topic. That topic has to do with Ashkaha, divine providence, and I did briefly mention it, that even though we have a system of laws called Masal, that is why it appears to us that the wicked are getting away with it. Nevertheless, there are times and there are certain sins that God does not tolerate whatsoever. And sooner or later, either at the age of 25 or at the age of 95, he's going to get it over his head. Now, you may ask me, well, why him at 95 and him right away at 25? I don't know. It could be that the one who's getting it at 95, his wife and children don't deserve to lose their husband and father. If the says, I'm going to leave him alone for a while. I'm going to get him when he's 95, when his kids are out, when they're all married themselves. Why? Why did he wait so long? He knows why. But there is something called Ashgaha. Let's not forget that even though there's a system of Mazalot, it does not exclude him interceding from time to time, either as a miracle, recovery from an illness, even though according to the Mazal, it was doomed. People who were meant to live to 57, Hashem says, you know what? I'm giving you 15 more years. Why? You did allow Ashgaha. The merit, as you said, the the merit of him being compassionate over others, at this moment, when he's on the surgeon's table, 
They're going to make a decision because the books are open. Should we just let him go now? Or should we add? That is what Rosh Hashanah is all about. What's a really good, real great deal? What's Rosh Hashanah all about if everything is predecided? Why are we being judged? Judgment should come at the end of our life. We're being judged every night. It's a mini judgment. We're being judged once a year for the year. And we're being judged at the end of our life for the entire lifetime. So there's always a judgment of Rosh Hashanah to decide do we leave his mazal status quo or will there be a change in his mazal? Which already, since we're already talking about changes to mazal, leads us to the next question. Can we change our mazal? Right? So let, let me just uh, mention about changes to mazal. So we have Rosh Hashanah, we have days of judgment, days of reckoning, where there's an allowance for a change for the better or for the worse, or as most times happens, status quo, nothing changes. Rabbi tell us, in Mazal Israel, as somebody mentioned before, that is a very popular expression that a lot of Jews like to tell, tell me. How can you talk about Mazal? Oh, Mazal Israel, Mazal Israel, Mazal Israel, Jews don't have Mazal Israel. So why don't you look at the comments? Why don't you look at the commentaries? What do the commentaries mean by Ein Mazal Israel? They mean like this. They don't have Mazal because they can change it. It doesn't mean they don't have one. They have one, but they have the ability to change it to the Shabbat without Sakha. Repentance, prayer, and charity. Is that always possible? No. Depending how difficult the Mazal is, and depending if there's a good reason for one Mazal to be this way, or if Hashem needs the Mazal somewhat uh, flexible. You know what? Person did so much tzedakah, so much teshuvah, he's had enough, of hard, enough hardships already, I'm going to change his mazal from now on. He gets a blessing from a big rabbi, and it's a propitious moment, and he thinks that his mazal will become better. His mazal was not to have any children. Shem says to Abraham, Abraham, what's the big deal? You're an astrologer, I know you know that you're not supposed to have kids according to your chart, but I'll just change your name from Abraham to Abraham. I can change, I created the astrology, I can change the mazal. You're right, according to you, Mazal, you're not supposed to have kids, but don't worry, I can make that change. So we do find that the Jewish nation, ever since we received the Torah, and we were, we were called children of Hashem, Banim Atem Hashem, Hashem says, you know what, from now on, you are my children, I have a different relationship with you than I have with the rest of the world. The rest of the world is governed completely by Mazal, you will have Mazal too, but you can change it. Most people do not succeed, however, to change the Mazal, because usually that is what's best for them. Hashem says, don't stop. Stop praying to me about this. Don't worry, it's good for you this way. Because when you shouldn't pray, you're allowed to pray to alleviate your situation. In the end, what happens is up to him. 